Hi, thanks for joining me. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. As usual, we are sponsored by NetSuite from Oracle. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. And while you're there, you'll be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an industry expert in your category. Why not check them out? NetSuite.com slash different. Also off the top, again, want to say thank you to the folks at DataBird Research for naming us one of their top 100 outstanding podcasts. Um, that's a hell of a thing to say. So thank you so much. We deeply, deeply appreciate it. Now, my buddy David Cancel is back. And we have an awesome conversation to share with you. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur. He was the co-founder of $5 billion HubSpot. And he's the co-founder, CEO of uh, his newest startup, Drift. He's also a podcaster. I love his podcast with his partner, uh, 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 DG, DC and DG. Um, the podcast is called Seeking Wisdom. And... He is a number one best-selling author. That's right. His new book just came out and it hit number one on Amazon. It's called Conversational Marketing, How the World's Fastest Growing Companies Use Chatbots to Generate Leads. Uh, in our dialogue today, we unpack why conversational marketing is the future. We, of course, talk categories, startup marketing, and a lot more. There's tons of practical insights on this episode from, uh, from DC. Why not go to lockhead.com, check out the show notes for this episode. You'll see the key takeaways from this episode. And now, hey-ho, let's go. Thank you for having me back on, man. I'm hey, psyched. man, I'm, I'm stoked. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Same. what you're doing at Drift. Uh, I love the podcast, man. I got to tell you, I'm addicted to seeking wisdom. Get out of here. That's awesome. No, I, I do. Uh, but I have a complaint. Can I register Please. my complaint with you? Yeah. All and this them. is true of all the podcasts that I like. And this may sound crazy. There's not enough episodes, man. <laughs> That's crazy. More episodes. No. And I look, I, I, I respect the things that you're doing with other people and all that. Yeah. But I want you and DG. That's I it. like the, those are the episodes I like. Maybe I listen to some. Maybe I don't listen to some. The yeah. others. Yeah. But when it's you and DG riffing, talking about, you know, Charlie Munger and shit. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, they're these bullshit entrepreneur, uh, I call them porn stars, you know, these idiots like Ty yeah. Lopez and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gary V and yeah, Grant yeah. Cardone. Endless. They're just douchebags, right? Yeah. I say, well, why do you listen to that shit? It's just bullshit. <laughs> and they say, okay, well, what should I listen to? I said, why don't you listen to the podcast of a real entrepreneur, DC and DG? That's awesome, man. No higher praise. No, seriously. That, 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 that porn star, hustle, 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 follow your passion, idiotic bullshit is a waste of time. Yeah, but it's I love amazing. You know, the operators are, uh, are never trying to bring more operators in it because the operators like you are never, when they're operating, they don't have time for podcasts, right? So it's hard for them to, to make this, you know, to those people to get exposed to everyone else. And so they just see the people who are professional influencers you know, social media people. Well, and can we talk about this word influencer? Ugh, yeah. What the fuck's going on that people want to be know. an influencer? That's what people want to grow up to be now. We got our head totally screwed on wrong now, don't we? Yeah. I would uh, think first you would have to do something before you could be an influencer. Yeah, right. I want to be a 23-year-old influencer. I took some Tony Robbins classes and I'm ready to go. <laughs> right? Oh, it's crazy. I wish they would have at least taken the Tony Robbins class. Yeah, ma maybe if you that. studied Tony Robbins a little harder. Yeah. You know, like I know one of Tony's top guys is a guy named Rock Thomas. He's been on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And now that guy's a guy worth listening to. Yeah. And he's he had a real time. career in real estate and, you know, done some incredible things outside of the Tony Robbins world. If you're going to listen to guy, go listen to Rock, not, not these idiots. Yeah, I did this episode a long time ago on our, on our podcast at the very beginning called Carry the Water. And the whole idea was, as you know, you got to carry the water a long time before you go out and espouse anything. Yes. And I was telling DG that in, here in, uh, you know, I had started, it was 10 years from starting my first company before I ever went to a meetup, before I ever even met people in, the, in, in our area, in Boston, in the community. And most of them thought like, isn't your company in San Francisco? I thought that company was, I was like, no, we're in Boston. 
I've never left the office. I've been working this whole time, but I was doing it for at least 10 years before going out there. Crazy. I think your sound just cut off, Chris. Oh, did, did, did I mute myself no, no, or something? Okay. Yeah. So you, 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 for 10 years you were working, you weren't doing tweets. No, no, I wasn't doing just tweets. I was working. I was, nobody knew who I was. I was just in the back. And you were working for years, right, with no tweets, no, no nothing. Yeah, 25, well, 30 years before I started writing and podcasting. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. You know, carrying some water. <laughs> <laughs> and I carrying spilled a lot of water. Yeah, yeah, spilled, spilled the water. Spilled a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it. I got beat up by a lot of folks as I was dragging that water. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That doesn't exist anymore, though. No, it it is weird, this thing about um, not wanting to do the work, but wanting to be, you know, an internet moron, porn star, celebrity. It's crazy. That's why I love Pressfield, Stephen Pressfield, all his books. I just love his thing of do the work. You just got to do the work, right? Do bring the shovel, do the hard work. That's how you learn. Yes. The other one that drives me nuts, influencer is probably number one. And then number two is personal branding. <laughs> I got to work on my personal brand here, DC. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. How's it turning out? Fuck. Hey, I got a different... No, but this is the thing I, I chat with, particularly younger entrepreneurs about yeah. all the time, the distinction between a personal brand and a reputation. Ooh, I like that. No one uses that word anymore, reputation. Yeah, let's talk about a reputation because if you want a brand, it starts with a reputation and a reputation starts with, to use the phrase, carrying the water, doing yeah. the work, producing the results. Right? Yeah. Becoming a person of substance that can be relied upon to produce results. When you become that kind of a person, then you develop a reputation. And then when you have a reputation, people think about you. They go, oh, DC, yeah, he's an awesome entrepreneur in the, in the greater Boston area, man. Built some great companies, public com HubSpot, got this new company, right? That's called a reputation. Now, you could argue you now have a personal brand but it isn't because you sat there and said oh what personal what should i build my personal brand around what should i own <laughs> you know it's such contrived bullshit yeah and the, the crazy thing one of the things you mentioned there that's super important is like that you've repeatedly done something because there's so many people that you see out there who may have done one thing and they've done it once they haven't done what you've done over company after company after company, right? Over and over and over. That's who I want to learn from, right? You want to learn from the athlete. You want to learn from the entrepreneur. You want to learn from whoever it is that's repeatedly done something. Not that they did something one time. Well, exactly. It's like we were talking about my, my uh, personal trainer, Joey Wolf. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, he was a professional baseball player. Yep. Okay. Well, that speaks volumes, right? Yep. And then uh, he made it to the minor leagues. He suffered an injury that, you know, was not going to allow him to, to make it to the majors. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, so now what do I want to do? I want to make athletics my life. And he decided to become a trainer because he wanted other people to fulfill their best life around their physical capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. And he trains uh, world-class major league baseball players. He trains Luke Rockhold from the UFC. Oh, wow. He trains Nat Young, who was the... Uh, rookie of the year on the world surf surf tour and many others Crazy. right well that's who you want to train with isn't it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're not going to go train with somebody who got there just hung out a shingle and said yeah. i'm a trainer and, and, and they're an fat. Instagram account yeah <laughs> yeah and they have some instagram followers yeah it's crazy it's crazy that's that's my goal to someday be a coach right that's what that is a coach well, and I'll tell you, as somebody who's made that transition, mm -hmm. it's it's weird because and I don't, you know, this this will lead me to a question for you. But like my whole career, you know, in the beginning, I was the young guy, the up and coming yep. contender, right, going for it, working hard, sixty eight hours a week, all that, mm -hmm. traveling two two to four hundred thousand miles a year, <sighs> and it never occurred to me that one day I would be the old sensei guy, <laughs> the Yoda guy. That's awesome. Yeah. I never thought about that. No. But it's cool now to show up and be the been there, done that guy. Yeah. I had right? a realization at the beginning of Drift when I was actually when DG uh, came on the team and I was sharing some stuff and some of the early people. And I was like, wait a second. I w I'm used to being the young guy. I'm not the young guy anymore. Yeah. It's yeah, you're the old guy now. I'm the old guy. Yeah. Oh, man. It's good, but it feels good. I, I have no desire to go back. 
no, no I have no. As a matter of fact, um, the situation I find myself in, I actually view it, uh, DC, as the reward yes. for 30 hard years. Mm -hmm. you, you have know? no lust to go back to that. No. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the way I think about it is, you know, there's a lot of people who work 30 years hard at something, become very yeah. good at something, and when they're done, nobody gives a shit. And I, I find it, in, in, I find myself incredibly lucky in that, you know, there's people who still give a shit about what the, the, the been there, done that guy still has to say. I'm not like the old uncle in the corner going, ah, stop telling us stories about back in the day. <laughs> Be quiet, uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What led you to go from that to wanting to write the first book? You know, I didn't want to write the first book because <laughs> I'm dyslexic I and. That. Yeah, uh, and it really it was my friend Peggy Burke. She's um, the greatest um, brand designer in Silicon Valley. She runs an outfit called 1185. We've done many, many projects together. Mm -hmm. And for several years, she said to me, Christopher, you got to write the book. And I said, really? I don't have, do I really have anything to say? And she said, yeah, no, you do. And and what really got me in the end was, you know, she, she, uh, like you, books have had a huge impact on yeah. me. And she knew that. And she said to me, well, what happens in your life if David Ogilvy doesn't write Ogilvy on advertising? <sighs> and I really thought about what she said. It was as I drove you know, home from this, this session I had had with her. And I thought, well, you know, I, I don't think I have the career or the life that I have without that book and a handful of others we talk about, if you like. And then I said to her, yeah, but I, you know, next yeah. time I saw her, I said, I'm not David Ogilvy. And she goes, well, maybe you are. Maybe you're your own David Ogilvy. And she said, you got to write it. And, and so I just decided to listen to her and not listen to myself. <laughs> That's awesome. Peggy's smart. Did she do any of the work on Play Bigger? She didn't um, do any of the, you know, the, the banging on a keyboard stuff. But she was um, very much a big, big inspiration for me. And, you know, I acknowledge her right in the front of the book for it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I love the design of uh, Play Bigger and uh, Niche Down. Oh, no, excuse me. No, no. She designed the cover of Play, of Play Bigger. Oh, get out of here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I've yeah. always loved it. I'm like, wow, this is well done. That's her Very firm. Well. And I got to tell you, I don't want to mention names because it, it, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm throwing anybody under the bus. Yeah. But um, uh, being in the role that I'm in now, people send me their books and their PR agents want them to come on the show and stuff, yeah. which is very, very cool. And uh, I've gotten a couple recently where the covers look surprisingly like Play Bigger or Niche Down. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, by a couple of big time authors, like way bigger yeah. time than me. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, this yeah. looks familiar. That looks, that looks, <laughs> that looks cool, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to That's find amazing. a way to compliment them on the cover of their book without yeah. sounding like a douchebag because I don't yeah. mean it that way. I think it's cool. It's, it's cool, cool to get ripped off. Totally. Totally. Well, and speaking of getting ripped off, you know, there's, there's this podcast company, Gimlet. Yeah. Yeah, the NPR, ex-NPR people. Yeah. Well, they ripped off the idea for Legends and Losers. They got a podcast called Without Fail. What? It's all about how failure leads to success. And I'm like, really? You fucking <laughs> bastards. You just, you just ripped that shit right off. And That's then amazing. Right at that point, we had we decided to niche down and rebrand as Follow Your Difference. I'm like, yeah, you want to rip me off? Neener and honor. You're going to have to move faster than that. <laughs> that's crazy. That's amazing. I mean, that always happens. Uh, anything that's, that's worth doing out there gets copied for sure. You got to deal with that. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, you, I mean, you have it. Guys are ripping yeah. off Drift left, right, and center. Every day. Have you, you had anybody stuff. rip off conversational marketing yet? Oh, yeah, everything. I mean, we, you know, even silly stuff, like in the beginning of the super silly stuff that, you know, you look at it and you're like, they don't actually, why are they doing that? Like we, one of our designers long ago in our product, which is at the very bottom, instead of saying we're powered by drift, right? It says we're lightning bolt emoji, right? Just the emoji sign by dr uh, drift. And one of our designers had done that. And I had seen it at the beginning when we started. I was like, oh, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing that? Then I forgot about it. It kept going and it became its own thing. And now there are at least 50 clones out there and they all have, we're powered by name of company with the lightning bolt. With the lightning bolt. In there. Yeah. And it's like, that doesn't actually make any sense. Why did yeah. you copy that? Yeah. Like you copied something without even knowing why that's a thing. It's become a thing. It's because they all wish they were DC. <laughs> It's crazy. But you see stuff like that. They don't understand. But that's a good thing, right? They can copy, but they don't understand the meaning behind those things or if they have any significance or not. 
Yeah, it's completely inauthentic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. They and didn't. It, they stole your the theme for your show, but uh, the idea for your show, but they didn't steal you. They didn't steal the thing. They don't know well, yeah, why and look, it exists. The interesting thing is, I don't want to shit on their show. Their show's yeah. a good, perfectly fine sure. show, but it's boring as fuck. So maybe I am shitting on it. You yeah. know, th- there's a bunch of these podcasts that uh, uh, they're, they're radio shows on the internet. And totally, they sound totally. exactly like NPR. Yep. And they're all hosted by a generically boring, smart, wa- in, in, uh, com- completely ex- uh, changeable white guy. Yes. Yeah. With the, with the same, you know, weird, uh, you know, sounding voice, the same kind of voice, the same kind of cadence, the same kind of... Uh, uh, everything in the show and there's so many of those you're right i mean that's most of them i mean it right. works for you know ira glass and it works for some of the original people who did it with this american life and and uh, fresh air and all that stuff and a couple of those episodes but after a while it just gets monotonous well yeah and the, the host is completely um milk toasty yeah. yeah but the thing that really drives me nuts is is the editing and the production and you know they'll do three to five minutes of conversation yep. and then they'll do a bumper and then jimmy moved to the east coast and discovered da, da, and they're like y- you don't have to spoon feed me this fucking shit just let me consume it but no they <laughs> it's all it, it's terrible i you know it's wild because it's going in the opposite direction right like th- what is amazing about podcasts and videos to me now is just like that you can be to your book you can niche down you can be yourself. You can find your audience. You can find your tribe. You can find, you can be real. And everyone is hungry for the authentic. And these things are going for the generic. Isn't that funny? I don't it's think crazy. they get it. Because I think they're applying an old paradigm, a radio paradigm to mm-hmm. a new medium. And they don't yeah. understand what's possible. It's crazy. Do you have a third book in you? I do. You do? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I never thought I'd have one. And there's a, there's, the, there's a third one. And I'm pretty sure we're going to call it Follow Your Different. And That's sort awesome. of the, the chronology in my head is, you know, play bigger is for biggie entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. I go to Sand Hill Road. I'm, I'm DC. I raise a bunch of money. I'm trying to go public. I'm trying to yep. be the next HubSpot. I'm trying to be the next Google. I'm trying to be the next Oracle, whatever, right? Niche down, small entrepreneurs. Maybe I just, maybe I just scraped together five grand or borrowed mm-hmm. 50 grand from, from my uncle or dad or mom or whatever, and I'm sweating it out. I'm a local person. I'm trying to make a good, you know, big go of it that way, which is most of the entrepreneurs in our yes, world, right? For sure. And then, uh, so that's niche down. And then a follow your different is going to be about um, you as an individual. How do I make my place in the world as opposed to find my place in the world? That's awesome. Are you allowed to say the title like that? Well, well, it's my fucking book. I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. I own the URL, followyourdifferent.com. Yeah, okay, <laughs> well, make sure someone doesn't jump on it before you did. <laughs> yeah, no, I already did that. And I, and actually, that's where the name for the podcast came to because it seemed to be that was the thing that resonated the most with people, particularly with Niche Down. There's a personal yep. element of uh, mm-hmm. in Niche Down that isn't as present, I think, in, in Play Bigger. Yeah. And I think, people really you know what they said to heather and i is like wow like i can be myself and i can find a way to connect you know my quote unquote difference to the world in a way that matters and build a business around it that sort of concept yep and because the world tells us right well we got to fit in we got to be like this person we got to play everybody else's game you got to get an mba you got to this you got to that and and many of us don't fit into those fucking right no lies that's the uh, i love it because that is where the world is going in my opinion right it's like uh, people are starting to realize exactly what you said there which is like all that stuff all that bullshit doesn't make sense anymore like those are like that's for a world that no longer exists right like that is not a thing that's not advice that we should be giving people that's not advice that i'm giving to my kids right i have a 13 year old seven year old that's not the advice i give them i'm giving them exactly the advice that you just said yeah and look, we all start, we need, we need to be inspired, right? So if yep. you're going to learn how to play guitar, you know, you learn the four chords of knocking on mm-hmm. heaven's door and you learn how to, you know, <laughs> and you wish you were Bob Dylan, right? And that, yep. we all start there. I understand that. And that's true for me too. But then you're like, well, I love Bob Dylan, but I don't want to be Bob Dylan actually, mm-hmm. right? I want to write my own songs, yep. right? 
And that's what you've done in your career. Yeah, once you have the fundamentals down, right? Now you want to improv. Yeah, I mean, you got to learn from Charlie Munger and, and all the great books that we read and all that and take their models and all that. And, but then you got to build on it yourself, right? You want to mm -hmm. stand on the shoulder of giants and, and try to innovate from there. Exactly, right? It's all about you need to know the basics before and the foundation before you can improv. Before like you can I've always off. thought the worst thing in music would be to be in one of these, we used to call them cover bands, but now they're oh, called yeah. tribute bands. Tribute? Why? Well, I haven't heard that. You know, they're like a knockoff of ACDC yeah. or whatever. And they just and play it's, the same songs. Well, and they're trying to mimic it exactly, you know, playing, <sighs> trying to play Led Zeppelin exactly, like you know, every note the way Jimmy Page played it. You're like, yeah. Uh, it's the worst. I don't know. The worst. Yeah. yeah. It goes against everything that you write about and talk about and you, right? It goes against being authentic. Yeah. And the other thing about authentic I've noticed is um, most people who talk about authenticity a lot mm -hmm. are full of shit and the least <laughs> authentic people you ever met. <laughs> it's crazy. But, it, but it's been a whole like progression, right? It's been like authentic being yourself or being different. I, when I grew up, when we grew up, was about being weird, being mocked, being beat up being whatever, whatever experience people have had. And now it's like people are racing towards being authentic, right? Yeah. Like, or trying to be authentic or trying to sell the authenticity. But that wasn't the case. Right? That's right. Uh, at least when, when I grew up, for sure. Right. The, it, guy, it, the guy with the mohawk in town would be the guy getting the most, most, uh, most fights in town. Yeah. You had to be ready to go. Mm -hmm, all you times. were asking for it. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, listen, I, and I think there's still an element of that, that that's, that's true. I mean, we still live in a world that teaches us that the way you're successful is you got to fit in. Mm -hmm. We've got to end that. Hopefully with your book, let's end it. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully people are niching down and all that. You so crack into that whiskey in the show? I crack into it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yes, I've been uh, uh, been doing a lot of drinking uh, over the holiday season. Oh yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, I here, here's the good news. I like to be physically active, right? So I like yeah. to go train with Joey and my boxing guys and martial arts and all that. I love to surf and ski and mm -hmm. and so the good news is it, it keeps my drinking in check because I like that stuff so much that if I like this morning's a great example. You know, did an hour and a half. Uh, at the gym, right, with Joey. Yeah. Well, so if last night, you know, I'm tearing into this whiskey, I'm six whiskeys deep. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to make it. Not yeah. going to make it. Yeah. And so it's a good governor on my bad behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need that. You need the guardrail. No, so yeah, I think so. Rails. Yeah, and you don't want to overtrain. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's okay to go in waves, you know, have some yeah. have some time off over the holidays, drink and eat a little too much. I uh I gained uh, five pounds over the holidays and quickly took it right back off. Five, you took five pounds off already? Yeah, I already got it off. Yeah, I, by, by, um, by Christmas Day, I had gained five pounds and I was like, all right, there's my Christmas five. I got to manhandle that shit back down to where yeah. it needs to be by New Year's Eve. So I got rid of that shit pretty quickly. That's amazing. Yeah, a little, little discipline for the old duder there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But, you know, that's the thing, you know, you, you can go up and down. You can let mm -hmm. yourself go for a little bit and then get back on the program. Yeah, you just can't go off the rails for too long. I, sooner or later, you start hating yourself, you know, at least yep. I do. Mm -hmm. Like, I can go off the rails for many days and have a very good time, but there comes a point where it's like, okay, I got to get, got to get back to it. That's incredible. I need that discipline. Let's go. <laughs> now, speaking of discipline, you guys are creating this category, conversational marketing. Yep. And you're doing what legendary category designers do. You know, I say it so often, the E in CEO stands for evangelist. Yes. You guys have written a no bullshit book. Yep. And, and you're really making this category happen. And you as the CEO are the evangelist. So I want to hear all about your thoughts on designing this category mm -hmm. and what is conversational marketing and why we should all be paying attention to it. Well, now, I love talking about this because I, I used your book as the blueprint, right? So we, we started this company uh, and, um, and we knew, we started this company Drift with the idea that, wow, this, the, 
the world kind of, and I said this before, uh, the way that we've been taught to do certain things, no, you know, no longer exists. It's perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. And so I grew up building, or my career has been mostly around building marketing and sales software for a long time. And it's been built around the idea of companies have all the control. We as customers have no control. And so therefore these companies can make us do whatever they want us to do, right? Like, you know, examples would be, they make you go to a website, they make you fill out forms, make you wait for weeks, they never get back to you, they send you a bunch of annoying emails, they, they try to call you, cold call you on the phone, like they do all this stuff because they have the power. And the realization that I had in starting this company was that no longer exists. Like we're in control, right? Like the customer has all the control. Now we're in a world of kind of infinite supply. That's one of the biggest changes that we've seen recently. Like there's infinite supply, no matter what you build, whether whatever product you build, it can be copied. Whatever podcast idea you have, it can be copied overnight. Like whatever you build in the world can be copied almost instantaneously. And there's infinite supply in every category. And uh, in that world, the customer has control. And so we thought when we were starting the company, we thought this is a new category. This is a new way to think about an existing problem in sales and marketing that we face. And so like, how do we create a category or is there a category behind us? And what would that category be called? How would you design a category? And I, one of our early investors was Sequoia Capital. And I was at Sequoia's office early on and they had a stack of your books there. They actually gave me a copy of it first. And then I went to the office and I saw a stack of Play Bigger in the office there. And, uh, and I brought that book back. I read it back on the plane. And, uh, and I started to share that with DJ, who runs marketing here, and started sharing that book internally. And we have tons of copies here, and we give it out to the internal team. But I was like, this, finally, like, I'd had no idea how, you know, at, my, at the last company, HubSpot, that I was a part of, we built a category. It was called inbound marketing, right? But we didn't have a blueprint for doing this. We didn't have a framework for doing this. We kind of stumbled our way into this. Uh, into this category. And then, it, but at Drift, we had this blueprint. We were looking at Play Bigger and we were thinking, this is, we had never even heard the term category design before, right? And so we we're like, this is how we build a category. And so we, we became deliberate about designing this category from the beginning, uh, about making, the cat, making it a category problem, not a product problem, not a company problem, right? It was a category problem because the world had shifted. The worry, that we had done things no longer made sense. We needed a whole new paradigm shift. And we started to build this category. And that's culminated into creating this category. Now we have, there seems to be probably every night there's new companies popping up and, and joining this category. And uh, we wrote a book for Wiley, a uh, business book publisher, which is getting, which will be re released on uh, the 30th of January of 2019. So you'll start to see that. Um, all over the place. And, uh, and we started to write, you know, the definitive book around this category called conversational marketing. And the idea is that we're trying to, we're going back towards conversations. We're back to kind of turning the internet into a conversation, right? There was this great book that influenced me many years ago, which you may remember called the Clue Train Manifesto, right? And the Clue Train Manifesto was all about internet conversations, right? Dialogue, removing, breaking down the barriers, and, uh, and a lot of what was in the clue train, we believe, is becoming real today. Much like most of the stuff that we saw in the early internet, a lot of that stuff flamed out. But those ideas are the ideas that are, that are massive today because the world is finally ready for that shift. Uh, amazing. Now, one of the, I mean, I, I just admire so much about what you're doing and um, the rest of the team and um, DG and the whole thing. But what I'm very curious about mm -hmm. is you are one of the very few entrepreneurs I know who, in your prior company, massively successful, publicly traded, category queen, category king company, HubSpot, you folks were, I would, I would describe you as natural or intuitive category designers. Mm. You understood in a world of... I don't know, you tell me, 2,000 marketing apps of one yeah. sort or another mm -hmm. um, that you wanted to, haha, -ha, niche down, pick a spot yes. you could really own, evangelize that, mm -hmm. and, and, and become the kings of inbound. Of course, it's expanded since then. 
Yes. But you you naturally, HubSpot naturally did those things. You guys were intuitive category designers. And so I guess my question is, having done it once with a multi-billion dollar category king outcome, Mm -hmm. but doing it more in an intuitive uh, way, and then now doing it again at Drift, but at least having, you know, in this case, play bigger, and I'm sure Mm -hmm. lots of discussions and uh, taking the experience of HubSpot and sort of being more, going from, if you will, Im- implicit or intuitive yeah. at um, HubSpot to very explicit, very deliberate at uh, Drift. Tell me about that difference. Mm-hmm. I, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience to go through, right? Going from that kind of like, kind of stumbling upon it and kind of like it coming naturally and not knowing exactly what we were doing at the time, kind of having that innocence uh, to... Uh, and then it just happening and it turning out and working out great uh, to actually being deliberate about it from the very beginning. Totally different. I think the thing that the, the, the things that are that I have felt that are different that we have measured that are different are uh, by being deliberate about it from the very beginning. Uh, it's become part of it's been ingrained in the company itself and in the community faster, right? Way faster than it ever did. At, at HubSpot. And that was pretty fast. Um, I'd say that, you know, that has met, led us to achieve this kind of growth from a company standpoint, but also from a category standpoint that, you know, we call, you know, this hyper growth that we've gone through because we were deliberate from the very beginning. And we took it not as just writing a book or not as just re, you know, resegmenting or retitling some kind of category or something, but we took it as a mission within the company and we were able to, from the very beginning, train, and we have trained every single person that has come in here as a, as a team member, as a partner, as an investor from the very beginning about what we're trying to do and how this is a much larger thing than, uh, than just Drift, than just the product that we sell today. And, uh, and really helped, you know, make something that's usually a little bit fuzzy within, the, within companies, right? Like, what's the vision? of this company, what's the long-term opportunity of this company, and made that something that's real that we can measure and that we have a process behind. It's, it's totally, you know, it's like, it's like going from um, accidentally, you know, uh, doing, fi- finding, you know, how to be, you know, good at sports, you know, like those natural people who are good at a particular sport to someone who comes in and is, uses a, a methodology with a trainer that has been world-class before. It's almost like the uh, first generation of those UFC fighters who were just yeah. good fighters who kind of stumbled upon this thing to the kind of fighters that we see today that are good at all of these aspects and they're able to do that in almost no time compared to that first generation. That's awesome. You know, I've said for years that um, category design is like a is like a secret black art. Oh, Yeah. Right. And once you kind of know what you're doing in this regard, Mm -hmm. it's 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 almost unfair. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. I mean, you know, in the in the first experience, we that probably took, you know, eight years, maybe, you know, eight years really for it to go. And uh, we've been able to design this category and get to the point that we have in two and a half years, maybe. So it's amazing. Wow. Wow. It's crazy. I remember Thank last you. time you were with me. You're very welcome. As a matter of fact, that's why I wanted to write it. And, you know, for me, play bigger and then niche down. You know, you pour 30 years of your life yeah. into 200 something pages, right? Mm-hmm. And you hope one day maybe one entrepreneur <laughs> might feel like they got some value. Massive value. I mean, Chris, we train the entire company on the book. The book uh, is everywhere within our, you visit our office here, San Francisco, Seattle. You'll see copies of play bigger everywhere. I love it. And if you ever wanted to do like a Zoom Q&A with your team, anytime oh, you want, amazing. Man. Anytime you want. Uh, Let me stoke would floor to. them. Absolutely yeah. stoked to. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know how many of them realize that we, uh, that we know the author. Amazing. Yeah. No, would love to. Love you guys. And I, it just makes me so fucking happy mm-hmm. that it's working for you guys at this scale. Oh, um, same. And niche down, we bought that, you know, even though that's about smally, uh, we believe that's part of our, our internal book club as well. We've got that, a bunch great. of those copies. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate it. And most importantly, you know, look, it's not like you, nobody writes books like that because they're going to become, they think they're going to become <laughs> Stephen King or, or yeah, yeah. uh, J.R. 
what, what's her name? Um, what, what's oh, the yeah. name uh, who wrote H- Harry Rowling. Potter? Yeah, J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. <laughs> you know, you're not going to become J.K. Rowling writing, you know, niche down or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you write those books because you're compelled to. Mm-hmm. And and you just hope one day it makes a difference. So I, I, I'm I'm so stoked. And the thing that's stuck in my head a lot from our last conversation, DCU, is, you know, because I looked at HubSpot as a massive entrepreneurial marketing uh, technology success. I yeah. mean, there's no other interpretation. But Drift, you told me, is growing much faster than HubSpot. Yeah, two and a half times uh, to three times as fast. The other thing that I find interesting, and look, kick me under the table if, 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 if this is not where you want me to go, but how, how old now is Drift, remind me? Uh, we just celebrated our fourth year. Fourth year. Yeah, So internally. as you were starting, the term in the industry that a lot of people were using was chatbot. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And everybody was building these custom chatbots. Chatbots, yeah. And... I think a lot of people in your shoes would have said, oh, well, we're, you know, chat bots for marketing or whatever, right? They would have just glommed on yeah, to that category. Totally. totally. And, you know, while well, the idea of a chat bot's a cool idea, mm-hmm. however, it's very, I would call it nose picky. Yep. Right? <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It, it, it's very incremental feeling. And, and as, mm-hmm. as cool as it was in the beginning, you could tell it was going to be more of a feature. It wasn't, this wasn't going oh, yeah. to be a giant standalone category. No. And yet I think a lot of people in your shoes would have just tried to glom on to the chatbot mm-hmm. uh, category growth and say, oh, well, we're chatbots for marketing or we're chatbots for websites or whatever the fuck they might have said, right? Yeah. But, but you didn't do that, even though there was, a, there, there, there was probably a pull a to path there. Yeah. yeah so, so tell me about that, how, how you thought about that then. Yeah, I kind of felt similar to you. Like I thought like, that's interesting, you know, chatbots for marketing and this kind of stuff, but that's, that's not really what we're trying to do. And this is the important thing that category design for me um, really linked with our long-term vision, right? It's almost like the bridge to me, right? It's like there's the product on this end and the service and this kind of little tactical thing and that, that'll change over time. And then there's this like grand vision over here and category design, at, at least in, in my world, is like this bridge between, right? Like how do, we, how do we bridge between this little thing here, this long-term vision and creating this larger kind of part of that vision, creating this larger change in the world. And I thought like, look, chatbots are interesting. That's a feature that'll come and go and that's an interesting thing to build in. And we, you know, obviously we built one from the beginning, but the larger change that we're trying, that we see in the world is this drive back towards conversations, this drive back towards uh, people, this drive back towards, you know, uh, the customer having all the control, right? And so like in that world, the larger thing that we're trying to do is change this, you know, back in the HubSpot days, there's, let's say there was a thousand, maybe 2000 tools out there. Uh, for se- for selling and marketing, right? And so now there's 10,000 tools that help you sell better. We didn't want to create a tool to help you or mission around helping you sell better. We wanted to flip it and say, we want to build a platform that helps uh, businesses buy better from businesses. The key is buy, not sell. And all of a sudden, when you change from selling to buying, then your focus is on the customer versus inside the company, right? What are the customer problems? And how do we be on the right side of that shift in history? And, uh, and by creating this new category around conversational marketing, it let us understand, you know, that bridge that vision with that product and say, this is the larger change that we believe is going to happen in the world where the customer has control. The customer just doesn't give, it, doesn't give a shit about like how, if it's a product, if it's a service, it's, a, it's this or that, or if it's AI or chatbots or who cares. I just, all I care about is that you made me feel special and that you delivered the thing that I wanted, that I wanted in the yeah. world, right? You delivered the service, you delivered the thing. Now, if you did that with humans, I don't care. If you did that with chatbots, I also don't care. If you did that with AI, who gives a shit? Uh, was it software? Was it whatever? I don't care. And I think that's the, we think that's the way the world is going. You want experiences. You don't care how those experiences are built. That's an internal for too long. That's an internal company problem that we've kind of inflicted on the world. Well, we can only provide you software. Why? Well, because we're, we only like software margins. Well, that's not my problem. That's a company margin problem. 
I don't care if it was software or service or AI or what have you. And I think, you know, Google and Facebook have done amazing stuff here. Uber, what is Uber? Is Uber people or is it AI or is it software? What is it? I don't know. I don't All care. of the above, right? All of the above. Who cares? Right? Is it when I, I use search software? On Google? I use I assume there's some level of AI and machine learning around pairing the right there's people driver to the right customer yeah. today. Of course there's people, right? And who cares what it is, right? That they just care about like I have this experience with Uber, with Lyft. You know, when there's I atoms, there's bits. Yes. Right? Exactly. And uh, that's the way the world is going. And so the same thing, what's Amazon? Is Amazon factories or uh, uh, e-commerce website or is it people? What? I, who cares? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. And uh, same thing, you know, we believe is happening across all industries. You know, when I search on Google, do I care if that's returned by software, AI, or people who fix that index every day to make sure it's right? Doesn't matter. Or, or some combination, right? Yeah, or some combination of that. It doesn't matter. And I think that's the way the world is going. And that's why we believe in this shift and creating this category around delivering that human experience, delivering that conversation, and delivering that uh, experience that people want. That's what we're after. It's not about selling more. It's about helping people buy what they want and then having this amazing experience throughout that, which we believe starts with conversations. I, I couldn't agree more. And there's something sort of interestingly fascinating about using technology to be more conversationally human, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. kind of an interesting thing, right? It's a mm -hmm. little bit of a mind fuck, but it's fascinating. Totally. So if I'm a CMO, you know, I've got a website, I've got all my mobile, I've got my omni channel, I'm doing all this stuff. And I say, okay, DC, I'm listening to you, baby. You got the new book. <laughs> 2019, 2020, yeah. these are the years to get d down and dirty with conversational marketing. What are the first three things I need to do to get, get started in this regard? Uh, the easiest thing is you need to find a way to turn your website from a catalog, which it is today. Every one of these, it's a catalog. It's a static catalog. Back in the day, it would be the equivalent of JCPenney catalog or Land's End catalog or whatever. So you can gum, you can leaf through this and turn it into a channel where people can actually tell you what they want, what they're looking for, and you can help them in real time. And some, and that's what we do at Drift, but there are other ways you can do this. But that'll help you turn your website from something that's available statically to something that's helping customers 24-7, 365. And we do that by a combination of bots and, and humans, right? But if you don't have humans, it can totally be bot-driven. But again, the customer doesn't care. The customer, the reason it works is because all of us are selfish, right? We want something when we want it. We want an answer now. We don't want to wait till later. And everything in the market today has been, has been built around this concept of later, which worked when the company had control. So you can start, put a bot on your, put a, something like Drift on your website and let it start helping your customers 24-7, 365, helping them buy helping them answer questions that they may have if they're already a customer, but basically treating them like you walk into your favorite restaurant or your favorite hotel and there's a concierge kind of bespoke experience for you when you arrive there. That was one analogy that was in my mind. Mm -hmm. The other analogy, maybe you tell me if this is the right one, is sort of almost like a personal shopper. Totally, 100%. Right. Yeah. That's what we want. So my wife loves Nordstrom, right? She walks into Nordstrom and there's this personal shopper experience. That's why she loves it. Now, can you get Nordstrom, the, the brands in Nordstrom somewhere else? Yeah, I can get them online. I can get them in a store down the road. But she likes that store and goes to it because of the experience. Yeah, and I also, you know, now I'm a talky kind of a guy, but mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like I want to talk to somebody. Yes. You know, even if it's something like, um, you know, like right now I'm, I'm upgrading my board shorts. <laughs> nice. And I'm trying to find. Bridges? Pardon me? Bridges. My bridges. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to find board shorts that I can use surfing, but that'll also maybe work at the gym and work for fight nice. training and like, yeah. and you know, aren't going to make me look like a dork. Yeah. And you know, so I'm <laughs> like, okay, I want to be able to do yoga or go train in them, but I also would yeah. like to go surfing in them. And, and so I kind of feel like I want to talk to somebody, yeah. but you know, you got to spend a lot of time Googling around when you're looking uh, for something like that in your mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this idea of being able to say, Hey, this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. What do you got? It's a very powerful idea. 
Yeah, it's going back to basics, right? That's how the retail experience, use retail, always was, right? And we raced as this world of scale, of scaling things and uh, making things uh, inhuman, right? And now we need to go back to this world, right? Of yes. this experience of being able to ask someone uh, for help. And this is more important now than ever before because we live in infinite choice. I mean, if I, I'm sure if I search for board shirts right now on Google, I'd get 5 million results back. Right? Yeah. And most of and them wouldn't you know, be what I'm looking it'll be for. 6 million. Yeah, yeah. It'll be 6 million and then it'll be 10 million. And it's going to be, so the truth in any of our categories is that supply is expanding faster, whether it's content, whether it's physical products, supply is expanding faster than we can consume. And so now we need to help people make a bridge that and find the thing that is right for them and the experience that they are willing. And, you know, guess what? All of us pay more for an amazing experience, right? Yes. So the only price premium left in the world, I believe, is towards experiences. If it's yes. any type of commoditized experience or product, I mean, there's no margins left in that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. Uh, you remember the book by Joe Pine, The Experience Economy? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and, and like a lot of great books, it just gets truer. You know, that book came out, I don't know, oh, might have been the late 90s, certainly was mm -hmm. the early 2000s in that yep. time frame. And that book just gets smarter and smarter every day, right? <laughs> absolutely. So many of those books, and uh, we were talking earlier about the Clue Train Manifesto, that were super early, kind of at the, the beginning of the commercial internet, at least. Um, now are becoming more true than ever. Like now is the time, right? The other mega trend I see you part of is the use, and we touched on it a bit, but the use of technology to make things more human. Mm -hmm. You know, like for me with podcasts, yep. podcasts are making real conversations mm -hmm. come back. 100%. You know, there used to be this word conversationalist. Yes. And they, I wanted to be somebody that was, you know, a good person to speak with and I wanted to be a good listener, mm -hmm. right? And then the technology took all that away as we became obsessed with the tweets and Kim yeah. Kardashian's ass and all that <laughs> stupidity, right? Mm -hmm. And now podcasts are augmented reality for conversations. Mm -hmm. And when you and get into podcast, me, yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. It's becoming even bigger than ever. I thought, you know, uh, people ask me like, oh, wow, there's a lot of podcasts now. I'm like, it hasn't even really got started yet, right? So like if we look at the trends, right, we see everyone walking around with their Apple AirPods, right? We see people uh, listening now able through AirPlay and uh, Google able to listen to this stuff in cars, right? We see people, everyone has a computer and a phone now, so now they can consume this content. It hasn't even really started yet. It's just at the beginning now. Yes. And, uh, and so there's going to be a massive explosion in all this. We can go home and have an Alexa, you know, device at our home and the Alexa device will re will list, will put on podcasts for us. I listen to podcasts on Alexa. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I think you guys are, are doing that's very cool. Um, you'll remember in the, I want to, I'm going to be maybe a little bit off, but in the 2005, 2008 timeframe, there was this thing bubbling up that the next iteration on the internet, we were going to go from search to yep. quote discovery. Yes. Yes. I remember. Right. That, that, that search was, I'm looking for something specific. Discovery mm -hmm. is the serendipitous thing I bump into. Yes. And we were trying to recreate that on the internet. And I got involved with a couple of discovery companies and mm -hmm. we all thought, you know, one in particular was going to be the next Google, was going to be the Google of discovery. Yeah. And of course it didn't play out and it was the right idea, but maybe the technology wasn't there. And in a lot of ways, you know, concierge is one analogy for what you yep. guys are doing, but discovery is part of it as well, isn't it? Yeah, the, uh, absolutely. And I think that was the right idea, but like so many of these ideas, Timing is the thing that is the hardest thing to get right. I think the time for discovery is just starting. It's just at the very beginning. So that company, you know, those companies were, you know, 10 years too early or plus 10 years too early, right? Because now we're starting to deal with that problem, right? Because the problem that we had in 2005 area was still being able to access the information, being yes. able to find it, right? And that's sort you know, through the rise it. of Google, yes. right? So search. And SEO, no one knew SEO. No one knew how to, how to even get something on the internet to be discovered, right? And that was PPC, SEO, and all that kind of stuff. But now we're at the point where we're getting, we're beginning 
this explosion of content, whether it's YouTube, podcasts, uh, written content. You can't even find written content for me. I kind of advise other marketers not to even spend too much, uh, too many calories on uh, on blogging, let's say, or written content, because there's so much now. It's hard to discover anything, right? But in yeah. 2005, 2008, if you were blogging, uh, you were one of the first, right, to be a commercial, to really be blogging out there, and it was easier for you to be discovered. And so, like this discovery problem is just about to start. It's going to be a massive problem going forward. Yep, I love it. DC, I could talk to you for 12 hours about shit, <laughs> for sure. I know, um, But sorry. I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we wrap? No, I'm still, I think I said this last time, but I still, I need to get out to Santa Cruz. I need to hang in Santa Cruz. Yeah, I want Hopefully you to come this, over. Yeah. Uh, next, when you're here, we'll sit down, we'll drink some of this whiskey. Oh, and, no. And <laughs> uh, we'll pick, we'll pick uh, uh, DC's five favorite books. All right, let's do it. And I'm we'll here. unpack them together. All right. Thanks, Chris. This Mr. Cancel, thank you so much and good luck with the book launch. Thank you, brother. I'll be sending you a bunch of copies. Please do. Whew. There he is, David Cancel. That's why he's the man. Now, uh, is it grow time in your business? Our friends at NetSuite want to help you master your growth. Why not visit netsuite.com slash different and you'll find out why thousands of super high growth startups and nonprofits alike rely on NetSuite as their business management software to handle every aspect of their operations in one easy to use cloud platform. NetSuite, NetSqueak? <laughs> you know, if you're gonna do a podcast, you might wanna learn how to talk, uh, particularly when mentioning your, sp your key sponsor's name. So why not try this again? NetSuite, yes, our friends at NetSuite, they grow with you from the garage to the IPO and beyond. And NetSuite is purpose-built for the cloud and purpose-built for your smart mobile technology. Imagine running your business from your phone with awesome dashboards that allow you to stay on top of sales, finance, inventory, accounting, order management, and yes, even human resources. Thousands of the best-known brands and fastest-growing companies on the planet use NetSuite to manage their growing business, and now it's available to you at a surprisingly low cost. So why not check out netsuite.com slash different today. While you're there, as a listener to this podcast, you'll be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry to identify opportunities for growth. Also, I want you to know if you're listening outside of America, NetSuite is a global company with operations almost everywhere, uh, except for maybe North Korea and a couple others. Um, so no matter where you are on the planet, NetSuite is your platform for entrepreneurial growth. Again, netsuite.com slash different. All right. We would like to thank the new book by our friend and today's guest, DC, David Cancel. Check out Conversational Marketing, how the world's fastest growing companies use chatbots to generate leads. HarperCollins Play Bigger, how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets wherever you pick up legendary books. The amazing folks at OneLifeFullyLive.org, where we help you dream, plan, and live your best life. OneLifeFullyLive.org. The official coffee of uh, this podcast, Verve Coffee Roasters. Mm -mm -mm. The leaders in West Coast craft coffee. Check them out. Uh, another book I love. Dushka Zapata's How to Be Ferociously Happy and Other Essays. And another podcast I love from the amazing Jamie J. He's been called the nicest man in podcasting, and I know Jamie. He's a buddy of mine, and I could tell you, if there's a nicer man in podcasting, I'd like to know who it is. <laughs> He's got an incredible new podcast called Culture Eats Strategy. Check it out wherever you get legendary podcasts. The good people at Flourishing Leadership Institute. They facilitate positive change. Check them out at lead, the number two, flourish.com. That's lead to flourish.com. And growwire.com. This is what legendary entrepreneurs are reading. Uh, there's amazing content up there. There's a podcast. There's a YouTube channel. Check out growwire.com for stories of innovation. And are you in Australia? Do you want to do some kick-ass marketing in Australia? Check out Rapid Media, legendary marketing, media, and communications in Australia at rapidmedia.com.au. And the incredible people 
at kiva.org, K-I-V-A dot O-R-G, where they're helping small entrepreneurs in the developing world with uh, no-cost, interest-free loans. If you want to make a difference to entrepreneurship in the developing world, check out K-I-V-A dot O-R-G. All right, I need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes, and this oddcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. All rights do remain perturbed. Uh, we are not recommended for wankers. Um, this oddcast is clearly highly flam- fla- flammable. Flammable. Hmm. Flammable. 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 I don't know. If you can say supposedly, do you know that supposedly, there's some dictionaries right now that the word supposedly is so often used that they're putting it in the freaking dictionary. Anyway, be nice to your mother. Support your local entrepreneurs. Don't forget to buy John's crazy socks to tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Listen to the Tragically Hip. Only buy pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Thank you so much, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Richard C. Kelly, chairman of Pacific Gas and Electric. Sorry, Dick, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that you spend part of your life with me. And uh, until we're together again, follow your different.